Right, so basic units of measurement. So, I mean, the sentence, I mean, try and read the sentence, right? When my son was seven, he walked three, and when he was four, he could throw his baseball eight and tell us that his school was five away. It's pretty meaningless without units. Um, what it's supposed to say is when my son was seven months old, he walked three steps, and when he was four years old, he could throw a baseball eight feet and tell us that his school was five miles away, which gives context to all of these numbers because you say when your son was seven, he walked three feet or three miles or, right, it could be anything. And so we have two common units systems. Oh, and I wanted to write this, like always, never write a number by itself, always use its associated units for a couple reasons. One, because it'll help you when you do the assignment and two, when I go back and grade, if I can see those units, I can see what you did wrong, if you got it wrong, and then give you advice on what you need to change to get the right answer. If you don't include any units, it's a guess. I have no idea what you did and I can't really help you, um, at least in that capacity in terms of like feedback. So our common units are the English system, right? That's feet, miles, pounds, that kind of stuff, metric being, um, those SI units, or the international units. So in science, we use these international units, or SI units. Uh, it's SI because it's in French, the system international, the units, I don't speak French. Um, and these are the most important base SI units. So it's actually, it's meter for distance, for length. It's actually the kilogram for mass. Um, it's the second for time, and Kelvin is the SI unit for temperature. Uh, we use Celsius because it's in like more understandable numbers. If you were to say it's, um, you know, 290 Kelvin outside, or yeah, 290 Kelvin outside, it's like, why are you using so many numbers? Just say it's 20 Celsius outside, or like 70, 65 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So the meter is actually based on um, the time that it takes light to travel in this set amount of time. I'm not gonna test you on this, but that is the set amount of time that it takes based on this speed of light. So that is how we determine the meter. It has a physical, it's a physical constant because the speed of light is constant. Uh, it's a kilogram. This actually isn't true anymore. If you wanna look at how they actually define the kilogram now, there used to be this, um, I think it was made of iridium, which is like one of the least reactive metals, and they kept it in like this vacuum sealed thing, and if you ever wanted to have the exact kilogram, you had to go to wherever this was, and that's the exact definition of a kilogram. Now it's based on a lot of physics uh, that I couldn't even explain. Um, so the base units, we have the, the kilogram is a measure of mass. So mass is actually different than weight. Mass is defined as the amount of matter that something is. Whereas your weight is actually the amount that Earth's gravity, or actually the amount that gravity is pulling on you. So pound is actually a force, and that's your mass being pulled down by gravity, whereas the mass doesn't change depending on gravity. There are actually places on Earth that have less gravity oddly enough. So you can go there and step on a scale and then like drive for 10 minutes and you'll weigh more there when you drive away than at the spot with less gravity. It just has to do with like the density of Earth being not consistent. Um, so mass, right, like I said, measures the quantity of matter in an object. So I will probably use weight accidentally a lot. Um, and like when we use scales, we talk about weighing things. Um, which is in part because we use Earth's gravity to de determine the mass. Um, so the gram is another common unit of mass. It's a lot more applicable for what we're gonna be doing in lab, uh, which is why you're gonna see that a lot more than you'll see kilograms. So for example, for some reference, a nickel has a mass of about five grams. A plump blueberry is about one gram. So, and then we talked about this some too. We have, um, right, a thousand grams is 10 to the three grams is one kilogram. <clears throat> so the base unit of time is the second. Um, you've probably heard of atomic clocks at this point, but the atomic clock 
is uh, how we define the second. And it's basically a 9,192,631,770 periods or vibrations of a cesium-133 atom. So you take a cesium atom, put it in a special instrument, and how fast it vibrates, if you measure this many vibrations, that's one second. And so we've tried to, in science, as much as possible, base these different things on constants about, constants that exist in nature, rather than like the foot was based on the king's foot, or the inch was based on the, king's, the width of the king's thumb, because those change over time. Um, so in the, S, in the SI unit system, we use prefix multipliers, right? You've already dealt with these a bunch. You've been looking at them all the time on the unit analysis worksheet. Um, and so these things change the number by powers of 10. So the kilo, kilo means 10 to the 3. And so one kilometer is 1 times 10 to the 3 meters. So if you memorize these prefixes, then for any SI unit you see, it's pretty easy to convert. As we went over earlier, you're really just moving the decimal place over. So if we take this one kilometer, right? Oh, actually, let me remove kilometer. And the decimal place is here. We're moving it over to the right three to give us 1,000. Same for centimeters and millimeters. So yeah, you always want to pick a unit similar in size or smaller than the quantity you are measuring. So that's why we wouldn't pick kilograms to met for whatever we're measuring in the lab, um, because you'll end up with numbers less than one, and it's just, for whatever reason, harder to work with numbers less than one. So most of what we do, the units are chosen for that reason. Uh, so here's a whole list of different um, units might recognize things like tera, giga, mega, kilo from your computer. You buy hard drives now in terabytes. Now the difference between bytes and bits gets a little messy. Uh, your internet service provider will try and trick you by telling you that you get you know, 1,000 bits, which is one-eighth the number of bytes. But so you got things like larger than, larger than one would be deca, Deci, I mean, deca. Deci is used a lot in medicine. Uh, you can talk about deciliters. Oh, sorry, greater than would be deca, hecto, kilo, mega, giga, tera. And then going down, you have centi, milli, or deci, centi, milli. Right, so tenth, hundredth, thousandth. Micro, you kind of make a jump. Now that's a millionth. So on and so forth. I'm sure there are ones in between, but I think, it's, I think it comes down to the scales of things that we work with most often. Yeah. Well, for exams, because it's usually the core of the question, for exams, you can look these things up. So you can come back to this table. I mean, I would say this table, or take a picture of one out of your book, or screenshot it out of the book, and have it handy, right? Because you don't want to have to go looking for it. You know, I mean, you could Google it, but yeah, I would have this handy. It helps to memorize it because then you can skip that step of looking it up, especially if you want to do more science in the future. Uh, so conceptual checkpoint, which is the most convenient unit to express dimensions of a polio virus, which is 2.8 times 10 to the negative 8 meters in diameter. Yes, one vote for nano. So nano is times 10 to the minus 9. Does anybody want to use anything else? Nope. Yeah, nanometer would be the best here. So you want to choose a unit that is close to but less than um, the scale of whatever you're working with. So if we were to convert this to nanometers, we'd have 2.8 times 10 the negative eight meters. And then our conversion to nanometers is at one 
one nanometer is one times 10 to the minus nine meters. You see I set this up again so that we have meters canceling. So it cancels out and then we'll do this. Um, so we should end up with, I believe, 28 nanometers. And this is an important thing to note about these conversions. You can write this two ways. So I wrote this as one nanometer is equal to one times 10 to the negative nine meters. But you can also flip it, because this is also true, that one times 10 to the nine nanometers is equal to one meter. So use this to your advantage, the fact that these are interchangeable, and if you can get them you know, both on top like that, you can do the math a little quicker. I wrote it the first time times 10 to the minus nine because that's what I saw in the previous chart. So, yeah, I picked one times 10 to the negative nine because that's smaller than one times 10 to the negative eight. So we also have things called derived units. It's like volume. Volume is a derived unit because it's a component or it's a composite of another unit. So for example, volume, we do things like cubic meter or cubic centimeters or cubic millimeters. And if you think about how we measure, think about if you're trying to measure a box, right? If you're trying to ship a box with UPS, you have to measure the length, width, and the height. And so when you take all of those things to account, let's say we've got you know, some imaginary box, test my drawing skills here. All right, not too bad, right? So if we do the height, let's say that the height is, um, height is 10 centimeters, the length is, let's just say it's, uh, oh, let's make it easy, 10 centimeters, and then the width is 10 centimeters, right? So we've just got perfectly cube box, 10 centimeters in all dimensions. When we multiply those all together, we also multiply the units. So we'd get 100, 1,000 centimeters cubed. So the volume of something is the amount of space that it occupies. And so it's a composite of length here. We also have liters and milliliters, which are volume units that are not derived units, which is a little bit tricky because um, one milliliter is actually the same as one cubic centimeter. So when we talk about derived units, there are things like this, meters cubed, centimeters cubed, millimeters cubed, just like inches cubed would be the English system equivalent of a derived unit. <laughs> yeah, math problems, right? Or uh, word problems. If you have four pencils and I have seven apples, how many pancakes will fit on the roof? Purple, because aliens don't wear hats, obviously. Easy. Um, <laughs> to try and help with math problems and these problem solving and unit conversions, um, we want to try and get to an equation based on the word problem. And this requires critical thinking. There's not gonna be a simple formula that fits to every single word problem equally. Um, and you, have to, you can learn problem solving strategies. Many problems can be thought, through, thought of as unit conversion problems, especially in chemistry, uh, because a lot of what we're doing is converting from one unit to another. Um, while other problems will require the use of specific. So units are multiplied, divided, and canceled just like other algebraic quantities. Right, I think I talked about this I don't remember if it was here or at Readly, but it's just like if we had, it's like we just talked about with the um, derived units for volume. If we take x and we multiply it by x, we get x squared. So just like we took centimeters times centimeters times centimeters gives us centimeters cubed. Oh, and another derived unit would be area. Because if you have centimeters times centimeters and just centimeters squared, that's the area. So we talk about houses in terms of square footage or apartments. That's a derived unit. So we can also divide these, and that's what we did right, when we're converting any units. If we wanted to go from um, one unit to another, we do that through the conversion factor. So 
this is what that unit analysis worksheet is all about. It's about using, using units as a guide to solving problems. It's called dimensional analysis. And it's another reason to always write every number with its associated unit. And always include units in your calculations. And do not let units magically appear or disappear in calculations. Treat them like these algebraic variables. They're important to the equation. So for most conversion problems, right, we're given a quantity and some units and asked to convert the quantity to another unit. And these take the form of our information given. So when I did that wine example, right, we had, it was like 11.98 for five liters of wine. This, because it's describing the relationship between two units, is our conversion factor. So this is our conversion factor. And we wanted to know the, uh, how much it would cost to buy 0 0.75 liters of that wine. So that then is the, here it says information given, but that's our standard quantity. And then we want to combine these together to get the information sought. So the price of 0.75 liters of wine. Yeah, per always means divided by. Or, yeah, I mean, like when you go to the grocery store and you, you know, comparing cereal prices, and it's like the price in cents per ounce. So if you were to multiply that 12 ounce container by the 12 cents per ounce, that gives you the total price of the container of cereal. Um, so just to, you know, take this example and set it up, we'd have our 0 0.750 liters times 11.98 for five liters. That would give us, I think what the correct units was $1.80. And you see, this one was convenient because it's already given to you sort of in the right orientation. We already have dollars per liter, and we want to cancel liters and liters. So this is where we're taking these quantities, and actually let me just write this out, do it in red. So this would give us, I'll do this too, I'm gonna move this to the back like a regular unit. Right, so dollars. Dollars per, or really dollar liters, per liter. So we have liters on top, liters on bottom. So something divided by itself is one. And so we can, oh, actually, I said I'd write these in red. So we can cancel these out. We got more examples. Um, so conversion factors are constructed from any two quantities known to be equivalent. It may be found on something like this table, uh, or it may utilize SI prefixes. Right, as we talked about, you can use those to con make conversion factors. Um, but it's any two things known to be equivalent. So I could give you on an exam, I mean, I could give you, you know, prices of uh, like cryptocurrencies is an easy one because they change all the time. So I could say like Dogecoin is, you know, 0 0.32 cents per Dogecoin. How many Dogecoin could you get with $5? And then do that math, figure that out. Or I could tell you that, you know, uh, one Bitcoin is worth one million Dogecoin, and then a Dogecoin is 32 cents. If you had five Bitcoin, how many dollars is that? And you have to do the conversion from dollars to Dogecoin to Bitcoin, or sorry, Bitcoin to Dogecoin. We'll do examples. So it's any known equivalent quantity. So let's, con let's construct these conversion factors. Feet and inches is pretty easy. We all know that one. So if one foot, that's equal to 12 inches. Right? That's a conversion factor. We know those two things are equivalent. Inches and centimeters is a good one to memorize. One inch equals 2.54 centimeters, and that's one of those special ones that's 
Oh, the exact means it's an infinite number of significant figures. So now we could rewrite these if we wanted to convert from inches to centimeters. So let's say we've got you know, whatever number of inches we want to convert to centimeters. We can use this, and we would put 2.54 centimeters over one inch, and our inches cancel, and they'll give us an answer in centimeters. And this is what dimensional analysis is. It's saying, I have these units, I know these unit conversions, and I can change those units into really whatever unit you want, right? We could do inches into any unit of distance. Uh, you could also do this the other way. So if you had a number of centimeters, then it would be, you wanted to convert it to inches. One inch is 2.54 centimeters. And that would give us our answer then in some number of inches because the centimeters cancel. Yeah, so if this, if this number was 5,647.456, and that's the level of precision that we had, then you'd keep all seven sig figs. So in solving problems, you always want to check that your final units are correct. And the way that you check is by looking back at how did I set up the units. So if you have centimeters, centimeters, those cancel out. You can see that that's good, and you're going to end up with inches. You also want to consider the, whether the magnitude of the answer makes sense. So if you're taking, uh, let's say that you're converting you know, five inches, and you're converting that into feet, and you do it backwards, and you have, for some reason, you get it wrong. You have 12, uh, 12 inches is one foot. You write it this way. Then you're going to get 60, and you'll actually end up with inches squared per foot because we're multiplying inches by inches and then dividing by feet. So you'd know that five inches is less than a foot, so you should get a number that's less than one. So you get a smaller number instead of a larger number. And then this, you know, I've already done examples of this, but you can, can, conversion factors can be inverted because they're equal to one, and the inverse of one is one. So it's the same thing, doesn't matter if you flip it. It's like this 2.54 inches, or centimeters is one inch. One inch divided by 2.54 centimeters is the same thing. Examples always make things better, and we're getting to those soon. We have to talk about solution map. So solution map is a visual outline that shows the strategic route required to solve a problem. So if you get stuck and you're given a number and you're given conversion factors, or like on the unit analysis worksheet, you have a whole table of conversion factors, you can set up a solution map first, and then you'll know which conversion factors to go hunt down and plug in. So for unit conversion, a solution map focuses on the units and how to convert from one unit to another. So like going from inches to centimeters, right? we're starting with inches and we're converting to centimeters. And so you'll set up in between these your conversion factor. And again, notice that this first one we're starting with is inches. So the denominator here is in inches because those will then cancel out to give us units of centimeters. And if we flip that, go from centimeters to inches, our unit here on the bottom is centimeters to match this. For general problem solving strategy, this is what I was talking about with that wine problem, you identify the starting point. And the starting point is not going to be a conversion factor. It might be a derived unit, but it's not going to be a conversion factor. And then you want to identify the end point, which you must find. So again, let me rewrite this. Right, we had $11.98 per five liters. And we knew we wanted 750 liters. And we wanted to know how many how many dollars? So our starting point, the given information, 0.75 liters. So our end point, what we must find, how many dollars? How many dollars does this cost? So you have to devise a way then to get from the starting point to the end point, and in this problem, you're given the conversion factor. 
right here. So you can use the solution map then to diagram these steps to get from the start to the end. So given your whole solution map, whether that's one step or multiple steps, and then find. So for this one, 0 0.750 liters, and then we're finding dollars. And then our conversion factor we'd use in between is 11.98 dollars per five liters. Again, start by sorting the problem. Just take all of the information that you're given in a problem and just list it. Then you can strategize, figure out which number you're actually starting with, figure out anything that's a conversion factor that's not immediately important, and figure out where you want to end at. And then you can set up the solution map where you're going from unit to unit to unit, and then solve it. So once you've plugged in all the numbers, then you just type them into your calculator, do the math, solve the answer, and then you want to check. You know, go through your units and your solution map, make sure that they line up, make sure that your number makes sense for what you're trying to do. Um, and then you can think about whether or not your number of significant figures is correct. Okay, now finally, an example. So we're gonna convert 56 inches or 56 centimeters into inches. So like I said, we're gonna write this out we have 56.0 centimeters. We have question mark inches. So for a solution diagram, since we're mostly concerned about units, we're starting with centimeters. We're gonna have some conversion factor here. And we're gonna convert that into inches. Right, because we have centimeters. We want to know inches. Now this is where it helps to you know, just look over those charts of the different conversion factors and just kind of have them not memorized necessarily, but know which ones exist. So that you know that when you look at this, okay, centimeters to inches, I know there's a single conversion factor to do that. And that is to go, that is five point, wait, 2.54 centimeters is equal to one inch. So this is a case where the first one is going to be our denominator. 2.54 centimeters is one inch. And then we can fill in our starting number of centimeters, which is 56.0 centimeters. My calculator over here. So 56. And you could do times one, but it's one, so it doesn't really matter. So we divide by 2.54. We get 22.0472, blah, 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 blah. And this is where, this is an exact conversion factor. So we don't worry about how many sig figs are there, but we know we have three sig figs here. And so our answer is gonna have three sig figs be 22.0 inches. Sig figs and conversion factors do not affect your final answer. So you don't need to worry about them when you're doing calculations, at least for this class. Uh, most of the conversion factors will be given such that they have more significant figures than the numbers that you're starting with to calculate. Yeah, so here, again, you know, to that point, we're going metric to metric, right? We're going meters to kilometers, so we keep it exact, but first we want to write down everything that we're given, which is 5,678 meters, and then a number of kilometers. So then we write our solution diagram as meters converting into kilometers. Let's highlight these. Four meters. And then 5,678 kilometers. So this is one of those conversion factors where you could just memorize one, uh, one kilometer is equal to one 
times 10 to the 3 meters. And so we write that in here, where again, 1 times 10 to the 3 meters, because that's our first one here, also because it's what we're starting with. We will get to an example where it's not. But 1 kilometer, and then we'll do 5,678 meters. So our answer then will be 5,678 divided by 1 times 10 to the 3, or divided by 1,000. So you get 5.678 kilometers, because right, these units will cancel. Meters cancels out to give us just kilometers left over. Yes, yeah. So what you did, actually, is you used sort of the other version of this conversion factor, where you could say 1 times 10 to the negative 3 kilometers is 1 meter. Um, so those ones are pretty easy, because we're just going from one unit to another. Um, but for multi-step conversion problems, we'll follow the same procedure that we did as before, but we'll have more steps involved. So instead of going from one unit to another, we now need to go through some intermediate step. And this is an example um, of where we're doing so to maintain those exact conversion factors. So if we start then by writing out everything we've got, we have 194 centimeters, and we want to go to feet. Then we'll write centimeters. And then I'm trying to think of like the logic besides just knowing that you need to go to centimeters to inches, right? Because we know that centimeters to inches is an exact conversion factor. And I know that off the top of my head. And maybe that's just something that you need to memorize or just have a list of conversion factors and try and put them together until you get the shortest path. So we're going to go from centimeters to, because you could also Google centimeters to feet. And it'll give you, you know, Google will let you just type in 194 centimeters and it will convert it into feet. Um, but for the purpose of this, right, we're going to go centimeters and then we want to end up with feet. And our intermediate step here is going to be inches. In this case, if you're ever going between centimeters, if really, if you're going from metric lengths to English lengths, then go through this inch to centimeter bridge. It's just the easiest way, because it's always it's an exact conversion factor. Um, so if you wanted to go from kilometers to miles, it's better to go from kilometers down to centimeters, to inches, back up to miles. Because it's going to be exact. So if we have centimeters, right, we'll write in, oh, our conversion factors. We use again 2.554 centimeters equals one inch. And then one inch equals, wait, well, I guess this is what I was thinking. You could do 112 feet. But we're not going to do that. 12 inches is 1 feet. So we can write those in here. Again, we want, set, we want to cancel centimeters. So we might want to write these like this. We want to cancel out centimeters. So we'll put 2.54 centimeters on the bottom. One inch. We want to cancel. So we want to cancel inches. So we'll put inches as the denominator, so 12 inches is one foot. Then we can add our numbers, so 194 centimeters. And you don't have to, you don't have to stop in the middle here. You can just do the math straight across. So you do 194 and then Right, because we're multiplying by one, multiplying by one. Usually the way I do this is I multiply across the top. Whoops. Um, I multiply across the top first, 
and then I divide whatever's on the numerators of these. So in this case, you do 194 times 1 times 1. You can, don't have to do those. 194, though, divided by 2.54 divided by 12. And you'll get 6, 6, 0.2905 feet, but because we have three significant figures, then we'll have three in our answer, so it'll be 6.29 feet. Oh, maybe I typed something in wrong. Oh, I did. Yeah, thank you. I, write, I typed 2.57. Mm -hmm. We've got more examples. We're at that point of the lecture where it's just examples. <laughs> Don't feel bad. No, like this is, yeah, I mean, you're not the only one in Chem 20, Chem 3A to struggle with this. It's like 90%. <laughs> A recipe calls for 1.2 cups of oil. How many liters of oil is this? And for some of these problems, you'll be just given a conversion factor, which is nice. But again, we're going to start by writing out the num all of the things that we have, right? So we have 1.2 cups of oil. Um, and then we want to know how many liters of oil that is. And then we're given a conversion factor of 1 liter equals 1.057 quarts. I don't think that's an exact conversion factor. The reason that it's not exact? No, I'm just wondering oh. why they're going towards them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, it's, it's to make it multi-step. Okay. Right? So we have to convert now from, we're starting with cups. Cups. And then we need to get to, we've been given this conversion factor, so we want to use that. So we need to go from cups to quarts. All right? So that's how I would know. And looking at this problem, I think, okay, I've got cups. I know how to go from cups to quarts. I've been given quarts to liters, and liters is the final units that I want to end up with. So cups, I just said quarts, and then to liters. So then we know that uh, four cups, oh here, I'll write it over here. Four cups, is it four cups in one quart? Is it six? English system, come on. Okay, we'll use four. Um, so we've got cups. We've got cups. We want to go to quarts. So maybe it'll be easier if I write this here too. So 1.2 cups. We want to convert that into quarts. So we'll put four cups on the bottom. That's one quart. All right, so that'll cancel our cups. We'll end up with quarts. And that matches this. And then from quarts, we want to go to liters. So for, we'll take this conversion factor. I just erase some stuff. Take this conversion factor next. And we'll put quarts as the denominator here. And one liter. So that our, maybe I should be doing this in red, quarts cancel out. And we end up with units of liters. So at this point, you can pick, take out your calculator and just do the math as it's written. And yes, please check to make sure that I've done the math correctly. 0 0.2838, yada, 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 liters. But because I think, I think this having four sig figs was intentional because we have two sig figs here. So we use the smallest number of sig figs when we multiply or divide. So we're going to end with two sig figs. Oh, from this. Okay. So because we started with two sig figs, then we're going to end with the same number of sig figs that we started with. That only matters in addition and subtraction. Okay. So we just divided here. 
multiplication, division. Okay, we got 16 slides left. <laughs> I don't know if we'll get through all 16. Yeah, depends on how many example problems are left. We might skip a little bit. If you want to see all these done, I've done all of these exact examples in those YouTube videos. And those YouTube videos are, have chapters, so you could, like, it, this says Skill Builder 2.11. If you go to the YouTube video and you go to the description, it'll say Skill Builder 2.11, solving multi step unit conversion problems. You can click that, it'll take you to that part of the video. So you don't have to scroll through the whole thing. Okay. A running track measures 1,056 feet per lap to run 10, 15 kilometers. How many laps should you run? So this is one of those problems where it's not given to you in the order that's most convenient. If you see 15 point six, or 1,056 feet per lap, that's a conversion factor. Per always is a conversion factor. So when we write these out, and we want to write out all the things that we're given, we have 1,000. 56 feet equals one lap. So you can translate that. Feet per lap means that one lap is equal to that many feet. And then we're also given 15.0 kilometers. And the question that's being asked here is how many laps should we run if we want to run 15 kilometers? How many times do we have to go around the track to hit 15 kilometers? So the question then is the number of laps. So this is where practice reading through and parsing out what exactly the question is asking and writing things down makes it a lot easier to solve this problem. Because now we look at this problem and we say, oh, we're given 15 kilometers and we want to know the number of laps. And we were given a conversion factor. Now, kilometers, I mean, this is feet per lap, and we want kilometers, or we're starting with kilometers. So there's a few steps that we got to do in between. But we'll start with, I'm going to try and write small because it's going to get long. So just like we talked about, yeah, so we're going to have to do, to keep our conversion factors exact, we're going to go kilometers, and then we're going to go down to, I'm just going to go straight to centimeters. And then from centimeters, uh, we can go to inches. From inches, we can go to feet. And from feet, we can go to laps. To go from 15 kilometers, this is, I want to show you how powerful unit conversion is. Because we can go from kilometers to centimeters to inches to feet to laps. Um, and get the right answer, or you can do it other ways. All we're doing is manipula manipulating our units. So to go from kilometers to centimeters, let's do a little bit of a side thing up here. We're going to set up one kilometer is equal to 1,000 meters, and then 100 centimeters is equal to uh, one meter. So if we want to go from kilometers to centimeters, we'll say one kilometer over a thousand meters times a uh, hundred centimeters over, oh wait. Oh, did I go? Uh, Do we need the mile? Yeah. Well, I think, I think the intention when this problem was written was to go from kilometers to miles and then to feet. Um, uh, we went 15 kilometers. Oh, this is what I did wrong. Because we're starting with 15 kilometers. So we start with 15 kilometers. 
and then we can cancel kilometers, kilometers, and then meters and meters, and end up with centimeters. So, a thousand times a hundred, so it's going to be one times ten to the five. So, yeah, so you're going to multiply fifteen times a thousand, then times a hundred. And then to combine these, you would say that uh, one times ten to the five centimeters per one kilometer. So we can make our own conversion factors to skip going from kilometers to meters, then to centimeters. So this is what I'm going to use in the, in the problem here. So we're going to put 1 times 10 to the 5 centimeters, 1 kilometer. So that'll get us from kilometers to centimeters. I'm going to go from 2.54 centimeters per 1 inch. And then we know that 12 inches, and again, I'm using, right, so centimeters. We have centimeters here, and we want to cancel that out. So that gave us inches, and we're going to cancel inches. So this is one foot. And then we're given the conversion factor from feet to laps. And so this is 1,056 feet is one lap. So I know, I know that all of these are exact conversion factors. I don't know. I mean, in theory, kilometers to miles should also be exact because it's probably based on centimeters to inches. But if we do this, it's 15 times 1 times 10 to the 5, uh, and then divided by 2.54, divided by 12, and divided by 1,056. So we've got to run. 46, and I'm just going to skip because, again, we've got three sig figs. So we're going to do three sig figs. And that's laps. Any questions about that one? Okay. Well, this would be the example of where we talk about numerator and denominator, but we'll finish this up. We'll finish these up on uh, Wednesday. Um, I do, we do need to talk about density first because today's lab is all about density. So density is another uh, conversion factor, or not, sorry, not a conversion factor. Density is a unit. Um, what's the word? It's a composite, it's a derived unit. So it's a combination of mass and volume. So density describes the relationship between mass and volume. So we all know that wood floats. Wood floats because it's less dense than water. Um, it's also known as an intrinsic property. It doesn't matter how much wood you have. All of that wood has the same density. So you could have a block of wood that's this big. and will have the same density as a block made of the same wood that's this big or the size of the earth. Always the same density. Right, so it's a... That's what this means here also. It's a fundamental property of substances. So like I said, changing the size of an object does not change its density. <clears throat> so we calculate the density of a substance by dividing the mass of a given amount of the substance by its volume, right? Because just like we've been talking about with all these units, density's units are in grams per mil, or that's right, mil, or in grams per centimeter cubed. So when we look at a, this example, a sample of liquid has a volume of 22.5 milliliters and a mass of 27.2 grams, calculate the density. So you know that it's mass divided by volume. So then our density that would be our mass divided by our volume for a density of 1.21 1 1 grams per milliliter. So this is an example of one of those places where you don't need a formula 
to know how to calculate density, you just need to know that its units are grams per milliliter. So it's always mass divided by volume. So this is where these solution diagrams can get a little bit more complicated and where the, this box is not always going to be the denominator. Um, so in a problem involved, or, yeah, so for a problem involving an equation, if you're to write one of these solution diagrams, these are the two units that you need to go into this to solve for the output. Yeah, absolutely. So, right, if you're given the density, is there a blank spot here? I'm just going to add a page. Oh, can I add a page? Real quick. Add page. Cool. So if you're given, like you said, so let's say we're given a density of 1.11 grams per milliliter, and we had a volume of 25 mils. What is then the mass? So for our equation here, we would say, well, we're given density, and we're given volume, and we want to solve for um, mass. So then our equation, we put our just put our equation in here, density equals mass divided by volume. And we would say, oh, we got one point. 1.11 grams per mil, 25 mils. And then you can fill these quantities in. So density would be 1.11 equals mass divided by our volume of 25 mils. So then a little bit of algebra, right? Multiply both sides by 25. And then this is actually a great example. 25 mils times 1.11. I'm going to rewrite this a little differently. Grams per mil will give us mass. So can you see here that we're taking milliliters, we're multiplying it by one over milliliters. So our milliliters are going to cancel, and we'll be left with just grams, which is the mass. So. For the sake of completeness, this will be 27 point, well, 27.75 grams, but then we only have, this is two sig figs, so 28 grams is the mass. Okay, and with that, we're basically out of time. Um, that is how you can use density. And I will see half of you very shortly over in lab. <laughs>